No, I mean, there's a lot of depressing stuff in the Old Testament. But for some reason, the miracles, not the killing and the mayhem, but the miracles is what actually gets me the most depressed. Maybe I'm just weird about that. But as a kid, I heard about the 10 plagues of Egypt. I heard about battles being fought under an endless sun. And I read about the biggest miracle of them all, the parting of the Red Sea. And I was enthralled by it. I loved it. I mean, every Sunday I showed up to church expecting that something amazing would happen. Can't tell you how disappointed I was. I remember once I refused to go to children's church because I had heard a little old lady say that the pastor had blown the roof off the place the previous Sunday. Right? And I wanted to sit in the service and listen and see if he'd do it again. Because in my mind, I just envisioned him just lifting up his arms and the roof just went with him. <sighs> Probably to a chorus of trumpets or harps or something like that. But to somebody who was raised on a steady diet of C.S. Lewis, David Eddings, Piers Anthony, and J.R.R. Tolkien, I saw biblical miracles, like climactic scenes in fantasy books or movies, right? Enormous, unmistakable crescendos of divine power, right? And then in the New Testament, Jesus says we can do what he did and more. <laughs> that if we have faith that we can tell mountains to go jump in the ocean, <laughs> oh, hearing that was like discovering that I was a superhero or a wizard. It's like, you can do miracles, Harry Potter. Oh, my word. It just blew my poor little mind. I could not believe it. The fact that I grew up living on the beach, that last little bit about into the ocean was particularly enthralling to me. I went down to the ocean as soon as I read that. True story. I found a nice hidden place on the coast where no one could see me, and I immediately started commanding the nearby hill, that one, actually, um, that nobody lived on to go and throw itself into the ocean. Seriously. Now, looking back, it's strange that for some reason, I didn't see me wanting to keep what I was doing a secret as automatically disqualifying me for not having enough faith, right? I didn't, didn't think that was a problem. But even as a seven or eight-year-old, I really wanted to be able to appear to other people like I had faith, even if secretly it turned out that I didn't have any. I tried for days. I'd walk down, oh, I just want to walk on the beach, guys. And I'd, I'd go down to the beach and i Use the King James language. Wilt thou throw thyself into... And then I used normal language. I begged, I pleaded, I prayed, I commanded. I used every avenue I could think of. <sighs> Not so much as a single boulder rolled down the cliffside. I was absolutely crushed as a little kid. But I accepted that I apparently did not have enough faith for miracles, and I moved on. Now, as adults, we chuckle kindly at the naivete of a kid that would even attempt to do something like that. But isn't that exactly what Scripture says we can do? I mean, that, all I was doing was following the Bible. And yet, no miracles for me. And not only could I not cause miracles, I didn't see any amazing displays of God's power on my behalf either as I was growing up. But I still kept reading about all of these amazing miracles in Scripture. And over the years, my childlike excitement began to fade into disillusionment and disbelief and frustration whenever I read about them. Because fine, I am small fry. 
I will absolutely grant that, especially if I'm standing next to him. So I can't perform miracles. That's fine. I'm not Moses. I'm not Paul. I'm not David. I can accept that. But why exactly had I never seen a miracle like any of the ones in the Old Testament? I mean, if God is still working in this world, if God is still working as powerfully as ever, then where is my miracle, I would like to know? I mean, as a pastor, why hasn't the sea parted for my church? I mean, I'm trying to lead people to freedom in Christ. Can't we have an exodus too? I've had my world completely collapse on me before to where I can only sit and cry and pray for a miracle. I didn't see any ocean parting. The sun hasn't stopped. Most of my enemy's firstborns are still alive. Not my fault. It's just coincidence. But we do, we still hear about miracles today, right? And I've seen smaller ones. I've seen, I've seen healings. I've seen, you know, little random a jug of milk showed up when uh, you were just about out of milk. Stuff like that. Personal things. But nothing like the Old Testament. I, the miracles in the Old Testament are just insane. I mean, they are so big. They are so mind-bendingly bold. They're nothing like that. Yet when I mention how different what I've experienced seems from what the Bible records, when I ask where God was in my trouble, the most common Christian answers that I get are people who just seem to want to get me to look into the future. Right? Well, just, I'm sorry that was a rough time, but just imagine the plans that God has for you. Just, yeah, keep moving. Have hope. Right? Just, if, if you didn't get it this time, you know, chin up and better luck next time. But that doesn't really help after a while, does it? Like, that might help on a wound that's like a two or a three, but you start getting into a nine or a ten, and that just, that doesn't cut it as advice anymore. Because if God only shows up in wishful thinking or in future dreaming, but never in the now, never in the trouble, then I'm out. Like, I will wash my hands of this whole thing and walk out. Like, I'm, that's not what I need. Because I need a God who is in my chaos. I need a God who is here in my pain. And I need a God who parts the waves and allows me to walk through when I'm surrounded by my enemies. Anything less than I'm out. So I stayed frustrated and frankly disillusioned for quite a few years. Until I really took to heart a truth that I had known my entire life but never applied. Notice the dramatic pause for drinking. Yes. Did you know for every sip of water you can make a pastor speed up their sermon by one minute? True. Think about it for just a minute. But here's the truth. The Bible is written with hindsight. Now, that seems like a really obvious statement. But it's one that we very rarely take seriously. It was not written to tell us what it felt like in that moment. The stories within the Bible were written to make clear how, God, how the people saw God at work as they looked back on what had happened in their lives. That they are written and they are there to help the reader best fit those events in the past into the whole history of God and God's people. So when we're looking at our lives today and comparing them to the Old Testament, comparing them to the New Testament, we are comparing our moment-by-moment struggles with centuries of their curated, interpreted events that were written to make sure that we cannot miss seeing God in them. 
Now, so often we read Scripture and we just assume that God worked in such enormous ways back then that no one could have missed it. As if the people of the Bible lived with permanent hindsight. A perfectly clear knowledge of where God was working and how. They did it. People of the Bible were just as human as we are. Just as easily confused. Just as easily missed the point. That's why they wrote it all down. Decades later. To make it clearer for the next generation. And if we put ourselves into the story as it happens, suddenly the whole picture changes. So let's take a look at one moment in the Old Testament as an example. Imagine being a slave your entire life. Your parents were slaves. Their parents were slaves. So far back, in fact, that only rumors and stories tell of a time when your people were free. It has been so long since you have known freedom that you have forgotten your own God. Until a man shows up. Saying that he has come from that forgotten God and he will bring you to freedom. Now over the next few months, Weird stuff starts happening. But it's mostly in other parts of the country. You hear stories, though. Stories about polluted water and about cattle dying, about flies everywhere, about crops ruined. And then one night, you're told to pack. And after a quick meal, you're up and you're moving. Because Egyptians are crying and screaming and are terrified. And they're shoving you out of the country. And you're a little confused as to why. So you grab everything you have and you flee. You and everyone that you know. Egypt, Egypt is behind you, but barren desert now lies in front of you. And you are slaves. How much food did you really have lying around? Not much. How much water can you carry on your back? Not enough for a desert. Now, I have trudged through day after day of heat with everything that I needed on my back, and it gets miserable very, very quick, and I have the advantage of modern technology. Imagine doing that in a desert with your children, journeying who knows where, chased by the mightiest army on earth. That's what the Israelites were going through when they escaped Egypt. They were free, but they were dealing with incredibly difficult conditions already, terrified, facing an unknown future and pursued by an implacable enemy who had held them captive for generations. Now imagine you are part of all of this and then your leader turns you around and you start wandering in circles. For mile after mile, you're just wandering, going nowhere. The miracles you heard about in Egypt have already lost their beauty in the heat and the thirst and the fear. You're ready to surrender. The Israelites were complaining to Moses. Was there because there's no graves in Egypt that you brought us here? Yeah, you know, the pyramids. No graves in Egypt whatsoever. You see the dust of the enemy approach. Closing in as dusk approaches. You set up camp. A huge sprawling mass huddled up against the water's edge. But you're trapped. The enemy army is all around you. And just as night settles in, you see the light from your God leave and go towards the enemy. Everyone is freaking out around you as darkness settles in. Now, this is not the night of the modern age. This is not the night that we're used to of cities and of electricity. This is the night of a desert. 
without wood for fires. Starlight is the brightest thing around. Think about the hardest you have ever worked, how you felt after that long day, and add to it the most scared you have ever felt. Bone-weary exhaustion. To shut you down. Your kids are huddled around you, terrified, crying, and you have absolutely no hope to give them. Your new God just left. You will almost certainly die in the morning. How could it get worse? And then it got a lot worse. We read this story from Moses' perspective where he knew what was going on because God spoke to him and told him what to do. The Bible says, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land, which is great. But without megaphones, without PA systems, without daylight, only those people closest to Moses would have known why suddenly the wind kicked up. Oh, and what a wind. A wind that could blow back water is no small feat. Let's just remind ourselves of what that looks and sound like. A wind like that would also have blown out every campfire, every torch, bringing in clouds to blot out the moon and the stars. Pitch black. In the middle of hurricane-level wind, and suddenly the people start moving. I mean, slowly at first, backing towards the water, and then faster, the press of humanity packing you in. The enemy must be out there. The enemy must be moving. The end is here, you think. And you scream for your spouse, for your family, but the sound is just whipped away as soon as it leaves your lips. You grab onto your kids and their tiny bodies are just shivering in the wind. They're drenched with the spray. And you just hold them tight, muscles straining against the surge of the people that threaten to pull them from your arms. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. Still haven't slept. And in the darkness, with the wind howling, with people pushing you into the unknown, the uncertainty and the fear come crashing in. That would be one of the absolute worst situations I can possibly imagine, and it went on for hours. All night, the wind blew, and the people fled. After a long day of walking, eight more hours of stumbling blind and in terror until finally the wind stopped and the people collapsed to the ground in relief and the screams of drowning men and animals began to be heard out there in the darkness. That's the crossing of the Red Sea for a million Israelites. It could have easily gone down as one of the worst moments in their history. Could easily have been remembered as a time when God abandoned them, a time when they wandered lost and alone, a moment of terror when they were promised triumph. And that is something I can relate to. Because that is my world at times too. Not that extreme, but it sure has a lot more pain and a lot more uncertainty and a lot more dark times than I was told would be in it if I followed God. I have times when I make it through and I just want to collapse in place, curl up in a little, little ball, and never talk about that part of my life again. But the Israelites didn't do that. Instead, we have what is easily the most underrated verse in the Bible. The people had gone through one of the worst nights of their lives, and as dawn broke, the Bible says, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And when Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, then the people feared the Lord and believed in him and in his servant Moses. Then they sang a song of redemption a song of thanks, after they looked back and saw what God had done, after they noticed the dead Egyptians and started piecing things together. The dawn breaks and they go, wait, 
aren't we on the wrong side of the water? I swear we started over there. And what are all these dead doing? Can somebody, uh, somebody tell me what happened with the wind? Like, I couldn't hear anything all night. It, it blew back the water? Wait, I walked through that? Wow. Thank you, God, for my salvation. Thank you, God, for the wind. What could easily have been the moment when the people turned against God, when they decided that God wasn't there, wasn't protecting them, wasn't interested, was the very moment that crystallized them as a people. It was something that they have remembered for 3,000 years and draw strength from. And let's actually pause for a moment on simple word, remember. Because the Bible is filled with calls to remember. Remember what God has done. Remember the deeds of the Lord. Remember the Exodus. Remember the cross. Remember. But remember isn't really an adequate translation for the original. Originally, it means to take action today in light of what has happened in the past. You know? To base how we live our lives in this moment on something that we remember taking place. Remember is a call to live with the courage that comes from God coming through. But more than that, it is a reminder to look for God in what has happened. To search for God in the darkness that we have come through and in the pain because God was at work there too. The Israelites, other than Moses, did not know what was going on when they were crossing the sea. They just knew what they were feeling in that moment. The soldiers didn't know Moses' arms were being raised and stopping the sun from moving. It just seemed to them like they'd been fighting forever. It was in the looking back. It was in the remembering that God's hand became clear. Do you think anyone watched Jesus die on the cross and knew that it was the turning point for the world? No. Every last one of them thought their world was collapsing. Every last one of them. This is it. This is God abandoning us. And in reality, it was the opposite. It was in looking back after the adrenaline and the pain had faded that they saw God's hand. Or even take the resurrection. No one saw it happen. They saw the effects of it and looked back to see God at work. But today, we remember those events. We base our lives on the promise of our own resurrection. We place our trust in the power of Jesus' crucifixion because what it looked like in the moment doesn't tell us everything. We have looked back at those events. We have seen God at work and we remember. God has a plan for you. This is true. But we don't just get strength for the darkness of today by looking forward. We get it by looking around, and we get it by looking behind us and remembering what God has already done. In my life, I want miracles. I want them big, and I want them obvious. I want the show without the pain. I want the remembering without having to turn around and face my past. Excuse me. Without that gnawing fear that maybe I won't really find God at work in my dark nights. But it doesn't work like that. I cannot live in faith without remembering. And I cannot find God if I don't look. And that means examining my dark nights, my frustrating failures, my pain, my worst moments, and looking for a miracle in those. Not inventing one. Looking to find where God was all along. And I just didn't see it through my own pain. 
The Israelites didn't invent or imagine God at work in the crossing of the Red Sea. God blew back the water. God crushed the Egyptians. God provided a way out. They just didn't notice. Too wrapped up in their own pain and their own fear until they looked back. There is no time in our lives when God is not working, healing, leading. Sometimes we're working against him, don't get me wrong. But he's always there. There are miracles that we can cling to if we are brave enough to look back for them. Not everything will click into focus, don't get me wrong, but much of it will. When Naomi and I were newly married, we had absolutely no money. I mean, we didn't have people over uh, because we didn't have enough chairs for them to sit on, first of all. But also, the extra $2 for more spaghetti noodles and salad was too expensive for us. That's a minute. I was regularly worried about what we would do. But every single time the food was running low, there would be bags of groceries sitting on our counters when we got home. Because God has ra had wrapped us up in the arms of a church family and was guiding their timing without us ever saying we were even in need. When I was looking for a first senior pastor at appointment, there were no positions open for a 22-year-old new grad. Who knew? Somehow that's the same regardless of your field. Some of you, that's more painful than humorous. Uh, but I was in a panic. I was doubting my calling. I was worried about money. When a friend casually suggested that I talk to one specific person that I had never met before. And two weeks later, we were on our way to Nome, Alaska. Two weeks later. Now, I could say it was a coincidence. At the time, I barely even remembered my friend suggesting that. But looking back, it is clear that God spoke through my friend to lead us on God's path. Later, desperate to go back to Nome, hating Kansas City where we were at. My wife and I were devastated when the DS gave the church away to someone else. We were absolutely crushed because we felt like that was our last chance out of some place that we hated. And it just, no options prevented, presented themselves. We felt hopeless. It was one of the darkest times in our married lives. But looking back, now with two daughters, I can see God's hand even in that. Because Nome, where we wanted to go, has one of the highest sexual assault rates in the nation. About 30 times the national average for young girls. Oh. Okay. Thank you for protecting us, Lord. From what we didn't even know would be a problem at the time, because Naomi was pregnant with our first child, but we didn't even know what gender it was. And now, looking back, I say thank you for making a way and thank you for saving us from pain, from ourselves. That was a time when God, uh, God worked like the story of Balaam and used whatever means were necessary to get me to stop. Time and time again, God has worked miracles for us in the midst of depression midst of job loss, miscarriage, surprises, pain, backstabbing, God has made a way through. Yes, they might not be on the scale of the Exodus, but God has provided food for us like he did for Elijah with the ravens, and God has stopped us from going down a path like he did Balaam and the donkey. God has spoken to us like he did with angels in the Old Testament. Maybe they aren't as large, 
is the Exodus itself. But if I had generations of stories to draw from instead of just my own, I guarantee you I'd see them. Maybe that's reason enough to write our stories down so we can more easily remember them. As a child, I want miracles. What I didn't realize was that those sorts of things happened all the time, all around me. What I really wanted, what I really was asking for, were obvious miracles. Miracles that don't take looking back to see. I wanted miracles that don't take faith to interpret. And those aren't biblical miracles at all. Those are storybook fables, fantasy stories, and myth. Those are movies. We don't usually get obvious miracles. But if God is at work in us, and I believe he is, we do get miracles. Because God is not waiting for us to have more faith before the Lord works in our lives. Man, you guys are quick. That's impressive. Okay. See, my worship team legitimately has walkers and crutches, and they take like six minutes to get up. So I'm impressed. (laughs) It's a good night for you guys. Good. Nice. Nobody's broken. I'm good. Okay. (laughs) You guys are so much better off than Trevor, trust and believe. But... God is not waiting for us to have more faith before he works. And I guarantee that because the Israelites were begging to return to slavery in Egypt when God parted the sea for them. Like that night, they were begging to return to slavery. And God made a way. In the howling winds, in the darkest nights, in the scariest times of our lives, we have not been abandoned. But it's hard to remember that when things get rough. The Israelites forgot the miracles of Egypt when night fell and an army approached. And when times got rough later for them, they needed something to call back on and remember how God had brought them through. Something to remember to help build up their faith enough that they could walk into the future with confidence that they were not abandoned. And that same confidence is something that we can have as well. If we look back at our dark nights and we search for God. For a long time, I didn't see any miracles in my life. Not because they weren't happening but because I wasn't looking in the right places. I was looking for them among the sunshine and the roses. I was expecting them to be obvious and wonderful. And instead, I find myself discovering God most at work when I have enough courage to look behind me at the times of the most pain. It is then that I am able to see what God actually brought me through. And when we see it, when we tell the stories of our lives in the light of what God has led us through, we too will have something to remember, something to build our lives on and give us confidence when we walk into uncertainty and darkness once again. And that makes all the difference in the world, knowing that God is at work in the howling wind, even if you can't see it yet. Because it lets you walk with confidence far beyond our circumstances. Because you're not there alone. 